our subject is living in peace. And we've come to these verses in chapter 3 of Peter's second epistle. Peace is the operative word in the verse. You may be found of him in peace. The peace of being joined is actually the Greek verb, united to Christ, close to him and joined with him. But here, in this context, it evidently signifies equally undisturbed. The fruits of peace, the war has come to an end, the war with God, now there is union, there is peace, there is interaction between ourselves and God, we have no judgment to fear, no wrath of God, we are at peace, we are joined with him. The enemies are made one, but the result is that we are undisturbed, not anxious, not wondering when the next salvo will begin and will be under fire from God, the coming judgment and condemnation. So we are an undisturbed, unruffled people, found in, of him in peace. We'll look at it a little further. Now this second epistle of Peter has been started with uh, the seven great virtues which clothe faith in the first chapter and then in the second chapter false teachers in the church and for the beginning of this third chapter profane teachers in the world and then after that the protection of the Christian mind and then here the great application on the end. It's a wonderful thing to read an epistle of Peter and an epistle of Paul comes to that, any epistle. Because quite apart from the teaching, we have reflected in the structure of the letter the very way in which the preachers preached. Now the apostle Peter, as you know, preached the first sermon of the Christian church on the day of Pentecost. And what a remarkable sermon it was its structure, its organization, its deeply intelligent arguments, its persuasiveness, everything is in that sermon, in perfect order and proportions. Astonishing. Peter was a fisherman, yes, but he'd listened to the Lord for three years. He'd been in the ultimate perfect seminary, and he knew how to instruct a sermon. Of course, he was aided by the inspiration of the Spirit of God on that special occasion on the day of Pentecost. So it's not only a magnificent message, but it's a perfectly structured sermon. And you see that Peter, the Apostle Peter, was still doing this at the very end of his life. This late epistle, not long before his martyrdom, and the final chapter, and you can see the way in which he preached, Sometimes people say, you hear them say, well, we heard a preacher when we were on holiday or we went to such and such a church, but uh, it's a pity, a very interesting sermon, but there was no conclusion. There was no application. At the end of the message, you said to yourself, well, what do I have to do? How do I respond? But you don't find that in the epistles. And here, in this passage we're looking at, you have the end of the sermon, typically, from Peter in this epistle. You have the application. And uh, the application comes, well, the three headings are provided for us in this case. Peter works through looking for, accounting, he's got three great words, and then the exhortation to be learned and stable. Looking for the coming day of the Lord is going to be his first application. Accounting for the reason for Christ's delay in coming again and how we must take advantage of it will be the second application. And then to avoid at all costs being unlearned and unstable will be the third application. So he even writes a letter like a preacher as an example to us, and it's the application we're looking at now, though there will be a little further to go after that. So first of all, in verse 14, wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for 
such things. The such things, of course, that have been discussed have been the day of God, the return of Christ, the end of all things, the great judgment, the new heavens and the new earth, the eternal hereafter in resurrection bodies, in the physical and yet spiritual, earthly, heavenly environment, which is the dwelling people of God's people throughout eternity. Now, here it is, wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, looking for the new heavens and the new earth. And the application is going to be along these lines. Always look for these things, something we're reminded of frequently in the New Testament scriptures. Watch for them. That is to say, wait keenly for them. Anticipate them. What have we been doing? Re to reflect upon our eternal glory and state and condition. Do we think often enough about it? When we suffer a setback, and a great disappointment, and things do not turn out as expected in this world, in our pilgrimage? Do we think of that great and coming day? Do we fix our eyes on the future? Or do we weep away the hours because of a small disappointment in our earthly environment? This is what the Apostle Peter is getting at. Christian people are those who have priorities and a sense of values and a perspective. They're looking for the ultimate day. They understand what this world is for and why God delays the end of all things and what he's accomplishing. And their mind is fixed on the future and eternal state. It's what they live for when they make a decision, when they make an expensive purchase, when they weigh up what they need and what they want. They don't decide according to what brings them glory or esteem or notice. They don't decide according to pride or covetousness. They, yes, supply what they need, what they require, but their great hopes are on eternity and their concerns are for the service and the work of God and the bringing in of the elect, the lost people of God and the work of Christ. These are, these are our desires and this is what Peter has in mind in his closing application. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, how many of us in this congregation, this is our great priority. Are we really looking for such things? Be diligent. It's not automatic. The devil will assail us with temptations, silly, petty temptations for earthly satisfaction, earthly happiness entirely. Well, we can be happy in this world. We're Christian people. And it is our task to make our families happy to make our husbands and wives happy and our children, but it's not our priority. Our greatest priority is the whole purpose of life, the goal, the ultimate, the eternal state. So we're constantly on the watch that we're not drawn aside and distracted. Be diligent. Don't let that thing take hold of you. Don't let that quite reasonable earthly objective become an all-consuming passion, something that fills your mind and your emotions, spending too much time and emotional energy on it. Be diligent that you may be found of him not only in the last day, but even now. It might seem natural to read this as be found of Christ in the last day, but that's not what the passage says. At any time, be found of him in peace, unruffled, not anxious, not dismayed that everything isn't going right for you, that you haven't got exactly what you would have liked, that things are not happening quickly enough. You'd like to be settled with one situation or another and it's not working out. So carried away with anxiety and disturbed. No, just here's the application of all the things that we've considered in the epistle, seeing that ye look for such things, if we really do. Be diligent, 
Be careful that you may be found of him at any moment of the day in peace, in union with him, but unruffled, undisturbed, not anxious, not full of disappointments about some loss, without spot and blameless. So Peter applies why this is what it's all about. Verse 13, nevertheless we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. What a condition that will be to be eternally purged of sin and purified and prepared for heaven, the place where in dwelleth righteousness. It's the natural habitat of righteousness and perfection. There's no sin, no taint, no disappointment there, no selfishness, no infestation of sin, no conflict with sin, no uh, unbelieving world against us, attacking us, dragging us down, no requirement to coexist with sin in our own souls or in our environment. Why, it's almost impossible to imagine in this fallen world, filled with perfection ourselves and virtues, no more battle against temptation and sin within and probably being immensely productive in the eternal state. The word of God doesn't shed any light on the details for us, but explorative and productive in righteous things and a sense of the presence of God, which is wonderful and overwhelming, dear friends and glory and environment of glory and praise and adoration and light and understanding and spiritual discovery for all eternity. Why we should fix our mind on these things. And if we did, we wouldn't be overwhelmed and anxious and drawn aside and so affected by any earthly setback. We look ahead to him. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Why, to be anxious and disappointed, because there are real causes of grief, we know. There are real disappointments, and there is still death in the world, and severance and parting. And we shall carry great weights of grief and sorrow, which is legitimate and understandable in the course of our lives. But I'm talking about those anxieties and griefs and disappointments which come for less worthy reasons, because we're deprived of or miss the mark in some purely earthly desire. Why, that's something which a sight of eternity and heaven should eclipse and overwhelm in peace. Well, that's really the first point, except that the Apostle Peter adds, without spot and blameless. Without spot. Well, there's an illustration there, obviously, but it's not absolutely certain what it is. Of course, it could be the spot that appears on the crop, on the plant, which indicates that there is a deadly uh, infection in the crop and the whole plant and the crop is going to fail and fall, there could be a spot in the individual believer's life, something undealt with, unrepented of. It gets worse. It's a tragedy when we fall into this and it's happened to every one of us. How diligent, watchful you have to be. Have you got a particular defect, blemish, sin, which you don't deal with? Temper, perhaps? Some secret sin? The tendency to self-focus and make yourself the most important thing in your world? Or coldness? Or perhaps covetousness? Do you have an undealt with blemish? It'll spread across the leaf 
and the plant and ruined the Christian life. And I've seen earnest Christians almost ruined by their blemish because it wasn't dealt with. Dear friends, let's deal with these blemishes, bring them before the Lord, pray for release, repent of them, work on them, make them, bring them to the top of the agenda. By the help of God, I want to eradicate this thing which keeps pulling me down in the spiritual life. Maybe you think it's not visible, but it's what turns you away from the Lord. It's what makes you cold and failing to get a benefit from the things of God. Some people think that the spot is not what I've suggested, a spot in the plant, say, which will lead to terrible consequences, but it's been suggested what Peter may have in mind, being an intensely religious writer, is an Old Testament analogy. The priests and their garments, not just the high priests, but all the priests who must proceed with unblemished gar garments because what must be evident before the people is that God is holy. And so in Old Testament times, they were bound, compelled, to go through the paraphernalia of an elaborate form of worship which constantly drew attention to the spotless holiness of God. And if a priest, a duty priest, involved in the lifting up perhaps of the evening offering, was seen to have a stain or a blot on his garment, he was disqualified, he couldn't function, he must withdraw, he must suffer the indignity of being withdrawn and someone else take his place. It couldn't be, maybe that's the illustration. A spot, a blemish on a Christian means we're disqualified from Christian service. We cannot be used today as an unrepented of sin. There's something we're not dealing with before the Lord. Without spot and blameless, there are things we don't repent of. So we carry blame, we've got guilt before God. You only have to repent and bring it before the Lord, but you stop doing that. You commit that sin too often. It's tiresome constantly repenting of it. So you no longer do. And so you now enable that sin to be a permanent tenant in your soul, as it were. That's a tragedy. I'm sorry to deal with these negative things, but we have to be precise without spot and blameless. Don't have a bad and a sinful or an unpleasant wrong habit that you do not bring into the process of sanctification, that you do not pray to be relieved of and work on and fight every day until God helps you to overcome it. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things as we've been talking about, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. Looking for was the first heading. The second heading will be in verse 15. This is headings of application. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Now that's not hard to understand because the long suffering of our Lord is back in verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but his long suffering, this is why he delays his coming, is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's because the Lord is calling out a people. He's calling in his elect out of every land and nation, every day and age. And when he's called in all those who were redeemed under the blood of Christ and who will be saved, then he will come. So he is long-suffering. He's putting up with all the rebellion of man and the pride of man and the objectionable disobedience of man. He's putting up with his insults and his unbelief, his non-stop climate of sin, because he's calling out a people for his own possession, and he's redeeming them. 
and now back into verse 15 and account that if Peter revisits the point and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation it's the same point the reason for his long delay and his long suffering of human sin is the work of salvation he said it before but now it's confirmed and it's confirmed actually in a stronger sense the entire field of salvation the Lord is prepared to be long-suffering in the world until Christ comes again delaying his coming number one so that the gospel call will go out and people will be saved and the elect gathered in and you could add to that number two so that his people will be involved in the work of salvation and winning souls why does the Lord allow the sin and delay his return so that we can be involved in the work of redemption with Christ co-laborers with him and to shape us as his people we prove him and love him and desire him salvation in the widest sense so here's the second application of Peter accounts that consider reckon think actively and often this is the purpose of the Lord's delay the gospel call and my work also all of us together for souls for the elect of God to be brought in the apostle Paul prays that for God's grace upon him for the elect's sake and here it is Peter accounts that so every day look anticipate expect desire the eternal state every day reckon that this is another day for the purpose of salvation that's why God has given it account that reckon consider that the long suffering of our Lord and his long delay is salvation just the one word in the widest sense the gathering of souls and perfecting of his people so that was the second point but uh, there is now a little digression it's in the second part of verse 15 and it's exceedingly interesting to us even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you Paul has written the same things well we know he has in Hebrews of course in the letter to the Romans in 1st Thessalonians and in 2nd Thessalonians especially the Apostle Paul wrote the same things the whole purpose of the ongoing world is God's purposes calling in the elect against the day of the Lord and he goes into great detail about the return of Christ in all those passages but look at what we learn here halfway through verse 15 in this little digression about Paul even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him by which he means the revelation given unto him hath written unto you Peter read Paul that's obvious one apostle reads another apostle the Bible time is going on the Bible now is being completed everything is being drawn together the Apostle Peter though he's in an entirely different field of labor is very familiar with the inspired epistles of Paul and he shows that his readers also read Paul he speaks as though they're very familiar with the epistles of Paul even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you they were even if they weren't in a place to which Paul had written the letters had been circulated the scriptures are being drawn together under apostolic guidance and authority 
The canon of scripture didn't wait for a church council after Bible times. It was drawn together in Bible times under the authority and direction of the apostles. And so Peter is able to refer to Paul as if he's a fellow apostle. Paul wrote as if to them. And Paul's other epistles are also in the canon of scripture, verse 16, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which I'll come back to, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures. So the apostle Peter endorses the epistles of the Apostle Paul as scripture and speaks of the other scriptures. It's all part of the recognized body of inspired scripture, the canon. And in this digression, you read verse 16, but this is for another time, that in Paul's epistles are some things hard to be understood. That doesn't mean that the Apostle Paul wrote in an obscure or unintelligible manner. It's that the doctrines are deep. And the doctrines, which are wonderful, are quite hard for our poor, finite, feeble minds to grasp. It's not impossible for us to do so. And we have to reach up and study them and see them. It's our privilege. It's our duty. So they're hard, but doesn't mean they're inaccessible, not to anyone. Every true born-again Christian has an anointing and with effort can understand the great doctrines of the faith, even the deepest and the most amazing, in which are some things hard to be understood. But the trouble is, they that are unlearned, they don't know any basic doctrine. They don't know the doctrines of the New Testament, indeed, of the whole Bible. And we're often saying this, to understand the Bible in its entirety, you must understand the basic, essential doctrines of the Bible. That's why it's a great help to every Christian to read a good doctrinal summary. To help, yes, with the Bible. And I always recommend the Puritan Thomas Watson's old book, A Body of Divinity, as a perfect summary of doctrine. The great, unassailable, clear, essential doctrines of the faith extracted from the Bible and set out in systematic order so that you can see them and grasp them and understand them. You need that central body of doctrine to cast light on all the scripture, to help you in its understanding. Now there are too many people have never learned any doctrine. They couldn't tell you what the principal doctrines of the faith are. And then they set out by some extraordinary means as teachers. And they can't interpret the Bible accurately because they don't have the anchor knowledge of all the essential doctrines. So they cannot interpret the Bible in a way which is consistent with its central body of teaching. And disaster results. And then there are some teachers who don't even understand elementary things like this. That before you interpret a book of the Bible, you must grasp what kind of book it is. Is it a history book? Well, if it's a history book, like the book of Genesis, well then you understand that it is literal history. But if it's a deeply figurative book, like the book of Revelation, which tells you itself, I am a book entirely made up of pictures, illustrations, visions, which are not the real thing, but illustrate the real thing. Now if you don't understand that when you read the book of Revelation, you're going to take it literally. And you're going to commit the greatest folly of all. You're going to go through the book of Revelation saying, heaven will be literally like this. The return of the Lord will be literally like this. The end times will be literally like this. 
And you will teach utter nonsense because the book warned you this is a book of likes, of images, of illustrations, of metaphors. Now, if you understand those in the light of scripture, they are clear and not necessarily controversial, but you must understand the type of book. Is it history? Is it doctrine? Is it figurative? And there are some people don't understand, so they have wild, crazy interpretations. And that's what the Apostle Peter means, particularly the cults, of course, in this. But not only the cults, sadly. They that are unlearned and unstable rest and twist, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So friends, we need, this is the final application of Peter in the application section, we need to learn. We need to study the doctrines, study the Bible carefully, understand what kind of literature we're reading, compare scripture with scripture, not do what the crazy people do, interpret one part of scripture and build a castle in the air and it's completely contradicted by another part of scripture and they don't seem to mind a sort of hit and run interpretation which just builds fences and dreams and crazy things but the Christian faith and the Bible in particular is very systematic perspicuous and clear and intelligent and always intelligently constructed but here in verse 17, ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before for a long time, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Watch what you see on the internet, who you listen to. Don't listen to people who are wild or watch them. They haven't any clear doctrinal foundation. And so they just follow their heads in interpretation and re the result is completely impossible interpretations. Well, this is the little digression of Peter, but the last point that he made is that we have to be learned and stable. And that's there in the 16th verse they that are unlearned and unstable. Ye therefore, beloved, verse 17, don't be carried away by that. Be great learners and be stable, firm. When something is clearly scriptural doctrine, this is the truth, this is the word of God, you're not open to being swept away by some novelty to replace it. You're stable. You know what you believe and you hold on to it firmly and clearly. And if anybody asks you, why do you believe that? You can prove it to them. You can say where you get it from. Don't believe a preacher who never shows you his working, who makes assertions and points like the charismatic preachers do, but never tells you where it comes from or can only point to one text which maybe can, to some extent, support what he says, but is out of line with a thousand others. They don't, sh remember when you used to do maths at school, show your working was something that came up so often, and that's how we have to do with the scripture. What's the basis of my telling you this? I have no right to tell you anything I cannot establish from the scripture. Don't listen to me or any preacher who isn't drawing it from the word of God. And half your television preachers, that's what they're not doing. Even the, you know, they're either motivational speakers or they're just making wild assertions. These are the days in which we live, friends. So here are the exhortations of the Apostle Peter looking for, look for that great coming day. Think of it often. Every time you're licking your wounds over something which hasn't worked out quite as you would have wished, well, switch your mind to thinking of that great day. Every time you find yourself spending too much of your time and energy 
more than necessary on your business or on your family or on your pleasure and on your leisure remember this account for the reason account for Christ's long delay it's so that souls may be brought in and we can be involved in the work of the kingdom also if Christ delays his coming for another year what will I have done in that year for him will I have been on the front line of the battle as a witness testifying to him in the work in the community or if unable to do that would I have at least had a supporting role in the battle praying for the work of evangelism the ministry of the word and the community and supporting in every way that I can am I able to say if God gives me another year it will be for him it will be for souls it will be for the course because I can't neglect my basic responsibilities in life I realize that my home my family my work all these things must be honorably and properly done but my chief priority if God gives us 10 years will it be for him what will I have to show for it so the first application was looking for the coming day a second application was accounting that the delay is given to you for the work of the kingdom and the third application was be a great learner be informed in the word of God and doctrine and be stable in these things a typical sermon of the apostle preacher or any of the apostles of the early church it's more for us to do in our study in this epistle but those are the three applications from verse 14 on towards the end of this epistle may god bless them to us and stir our hearts